When I was very small, three men came to our house. After having dinner with us, they pulled out a gun and killed my parents. Two days later, a lady found me hiding in the forest. She took me to her home. She is my new mother. Seventy-three, During my school years in Kohima, I finally began to understand. Our Naga people were originally 40 tribes spread across an area of 100,000 square kilometers. After Indian independence, our state was cut up to a much smaller area with only 16 tribes. Our people rose in violent protest. During the four decades of bloody conflict that followed, the Naga political movement was split into four underground factions. Some demand more autonomy, others want a greater Nagaland. But these differences in ideology slowly spiraled into fierce battles between the factions. Political assassinations followed, claiming many innocent lives. Terror and suspicion spread across our cities, towns and villages. In this volatile state of affairs, a new evil made its appearance, drugs. A steady supply of heroin trickled in through National Highway 39 from the borders of Myanmar. The strained resources of the army and the police were helpless to prevent the illicit trade. I started using drugs, but my, my intention is never to become an addict or to become a peddler or to become an extortionist. But when I become hooked, I become an addict, I become a peddler, extortionist, and so on. So that is why I've been laid up in jail, lockups, and so on. After college, I joined a local newspaper as a reporter. One of my first assignments was about a women's organization that grew out of our political turmoil. It was my first meeting with Mrs. Sano Vamuzo, the wife of the ex-chief minister of Nagaland. She is also the niece of the late Naga revolutionary Angami Zapupizo. We mothers, we thought we can do something. So much lies with mothers to show direction to our children, to help them to come back to the, to the right path. Whenever I met women, especially, they have many problems. I got a concept that mothers can do a lot of things in changing uh, our society. So we started this movement. At first, 
Mrs. Vamuzo and seven of her close friends began holding public meetings to alert other women about the imminent social crisis. For the first time, women spoke freely of their broken homes, brutalized by constant violence, fear, alcohol and drugs. When we set up this organization, some wanted to call it Naga Women Organization. But after thorough deliberation, we decided to name this as Naga Mothers Association because we, I'm also a woman, yet the word, the very word woman and motherhood, mother, there's a vast difference. Mother is powerful, mother is caring, mother gives protection, and mother endures all kinds of situations. The first meetings brought some hope. Most agreed that it would be possible to heal their society if Naga women could come together. Amongst many other remarkable women who joined the cause was her outspoken friend, Mrs. Kreleno Tarhata. We are not quite free in the decision-making situations, but because we are deprived of that one, Mm, to a great measure, we do see, think how those decisions will affect us. And we do talk to our husbands, to our brothers, which they may or may not do also. There is an area of influence that we have too. The Naga Mothers Association was officially formed on the 14th of February 1984. All Naga women were considered their de facto members. It was an informal, fluid organization whose mandate was to tackle drug addiction, alcoholism, and bloody interfectional wars. The first president of NMA was Mrs. Sano Vamuzo. Her immediate concern was to rescue families battered by alcohol and drug abuse. Their most obvious course of action was to stop the trade in narcotics. To really involve the government agencies, especially the police, they are always there. They are handy. We can always call them. But before we started our work, we had, to, um, we had to make them understand what we are targeting. So our members, we had meetings with the police also. We used to go and attend their meetings and just tell them, requesting them to help us to prevent these social evils. To enforce Nagaland's alcohol and drug prohibition laws, NMA volunteers took a highly unusual step of manning the check posts on National Highway 39 along with the police. This unexpected gesture lifted the morale of the state police, who made it difficult to smuggle contraband and alcohol into Kohima. The mothers publicly destroyed the confiscated goods after each large seizure. Support and appreciation poured in from all sides. <laughs> Meanwhile, the killings continued. Extortion and threats from some factions brought the state economy to a standstill. Many families left their homes to settle elsewhere. Whether it is war or peace for that matter, these are gendered experiences. That is, women and men uh, experience conflict differently. They experience conflict differently not because of any biological reason, but because of the socialized roles that men and women play. In the 1980s, NMA underwent a transformation from social welfare to active peace-building efforts under the second president, Mrs. Nidonyo Angami. Under Nidonyo's leadership, NMA launched a rigorous peace campaign by directly meeting the underground factions and asking them to cease hostilities. And quite frankly, if you have met Nidonyo, she has enormous presence. I mean, not only, of course, is she a large woman, which she is, but there is a sense of dignity, of innate authority that she has, and um, 
I mean, here is a woman who has lived through a great deal of experiences. Our approach is simple. Uh, in the spirit of motherhood, we go and contact uh, different groups and we appeal to them that they should uh, stop shedding blood. In the spirit of motherhood, if we approach, it works. In the month of May last year, the Chakasang Mothers Association, 30 of us, we organized ourselves. We prayed before we leave for uh, their camps. 30 of us, we walk to their camp in the thick forest, which happened to be um, I, am, I am camp in Peg District. So when we reached, they were very happy and they welcomed us because they know that we are their mothers. Some of the boys, they even seeing our faces, they were shedding tears. They told us they had not met their mothers for five, six years. So they were so happy uh, that we met them that way. We told them we are not coming to blame them, but we are coming. We care for them, we love them, and we prayed for them. They all knelt down, we prayed for them. We all cried because there is such affection we have for our children. They also remember their mothers. They miss their mothers so much. It was very moving. I went, I was with them when they talked to um, members of, or young um, um, members of the Kaplan group. Then when they talked to the Isaac Muiva group, they listened to them, there were grievances. I mean, these young men poured out their frustration, their anger at some of the leaders. Um, and because after all, they're out of touch. These women actually help to connect them with what has been happening in society. Nagas, we are known, our ancestors were known as expert headhunters. And presently now, when we think of the political scenario, so we are not far from it. The only difference is we have AK-47 rifles and other modern weaponry we have today. But those days, when we are fighting with one another, village against village, people against people, we cannot think of um, avoiding our cultivation for all the year through. So we do come around and agree to sit over um, what we would call as round table conference, sit together. I'm a weak group, you are a stronger group, but come to the table as equals. So instead of putting down one another uniform, trying to coerce one group to go to the other and so on, it will be more honorable and lasting to approach to uh, the problem in that manner, traditional way. In many situations, Nidonyo Angami and her colleagues virtually put themselves between warring factions and risked becoming victims of the senseless killings. There were these two warring factions, that is um, the IM group, that's the Isaac Muiva group, and the Kaplan group, young uh, national workers from these two factions, they were warring. Uh, Nidunu, along with um, a representative from the Naga Hoho, rushed there in a taxi or in a vehicle and stopped, and she rushed forward and said, before you shoot your brother, listen to your mother. We cannot go according to our plans. Huh? Our days are uncertain. Crisis arises anywhere, anytime. So, uh, till some solution is arrived, this uh, threat and challenges will continue. On the 5th of August, 
1994, I was called in to report on a memorial service at Kohima organized by the NMA to remember all those killed in the Naga struggle. The service started with the church bells ringing in funeral tolls early in the morning. Banners and posters were put up across the city. The whole of Kohima town closed down to pay their respects. Over 3,000 women from all tribes prayed together to the Spirit of God to heal their battered lives. The, darkness the NMA peace team was formed under the banner Shed No More Blood. On the 31st of July 1997, ceasefire was declared between NSC and IM, the most well armed amongst the Naga factions and the Indian armed forces. But their most powerful rival faction, NSC and K, refused to part of the ceasefire. However, it was the very first occasion for celebrations amongst civil society groups. I remember talking to some of the Delhi leadership. You are talking to people who have the guns. And uh, when we were talking, in the course of that, they said, but we heard the NSC Federal is already dead. I said, whether dead or not, you know it. But you know that they have the history and uh, the present negotiations that are going on shall we say, the IM NSCN group. They have the gun, and there is another group called them, calling themselves an NSCNK. They have the territory. So you decide what way you are talking to. But unless we come to the truth of it, problem cannot be solved properly. Well, it was easy to meet NSCN IM and the two NNC factions. No one had ever attempted to contact the NSCNK faction. Their hideout was at a secret location in the densely forested hills of Myanmar. In 1999, Nidonyo Angami and her colleagues set out on a dangerous trek to the NSCNK camp. Not knowing the exact location of the secret hideout, they traveled from one far-flung village to another, braving bitter cold and wild animals. This is not an area which is, you know, you, you uh, don't get into a car and you drive there. They walked. And these are not young women. It's so bitterly cold. I mean, they tell me that they wrapped themselves up in newspapers. They were so cold. Physically, uh, after walking for two, three hours, you know, uh, sometimes we, we used to move like uh, polio patients, you know. You become so abnormal. But you keep going, huh? continue going through the uh, thick forests. You just uh, feel um, that you are doing something meaningful. When they eventually reached the NSCNK camp, the surprise guarders gave them a warm welcome. The women informed NSCNK leadership about the changing social scenario and the need for peace. And they said to Kaplang, you know, why, why are your people blocking this road? This road is extremely important for us. Or why did you kill this human rights activist? I mean, who would dare to ask? Human rights activists from Naga People's Movement for Human Rights or the Naga Students Federation, they have also gone to talk to Kaplang. I know that they never asked these questions, but these women had no qualms. He agreed in the end not to become a party to the ceasefire, but that he would accept a cessation of violence. In 2001, an SCNK faction finally gave in and signed a ceasefire agreement with the Indian Army. In 2002, Nidonyo Angami retraced her difficult journey once again to the NSCNK camp to express her solidarity. Yet, the killing continues. The four Naga factions 
are still locked in a furious conflict against each other. In 1997, when the ceasefire was first um, negotiated, there was hardly, there wasn't really very much support for it because people were saying, "Till there is a uh, you know, as long once only the factionalism stops, only then should we proceed ahead." They were able to say, "No, let us proceed with the peace process." And to a large extent, it was the civil society activism and the critical role of the NMA and, uh, in this to um, mobilize a much greater broad base support for the peace process. So much so that it would be very, very difficult for the leaders to walk away from the peace table. They even tried to arrange a face-to-face -face meeting between Azek and Muiva and the Kaplang group. It didn't work out for various reasons. As I said, there's so many spoilers out. But what they did manage to do was they brought, there's the NNC, which is the, the other group, and they brought the leaders of that and the Isaac Muiva group face to face, and in fact a ceasefire to be negotiated. That they were successful in. I do know they brought, they invited them to meet. They met, they even ate together. But politically, they have not given up their stance. Through the years, anime has seen its share of controversy and misunderstanding. I met the widow of one of the Kaplang um, office bearers. I, I've forgotten, I think he was general secretary or something. He was killed, and he was killed by somebody from the IM group. He said, I think the Naga mothers are partisan. I think they are close to the Muiva group, and they are not. Um, impartial. At the first stage, when we first started this movement, there was so much suspicion, thinking it is political. It is not at all political. When we go and meet with you, then I should not be labeled as um, pro your group. Sharing is important, but as long as I have not identified myself with your group, you cannot take me as giving you the mandate. We don't depend or we don't expect uh, uh, people to give us, you know, grants so that we start depending on them. But whatever we do, we try to create from our uh, own end and then uh, provide whatever we can. I should say we have overcome this suspicion. I'm very glad. Meanwhile, Rising cases of HIV AIDS was being reported from all over the Northeast. Due to official negligence, HIV patients were often ignored as nobody knew how to treat them. The Naga mothers swung into action once again. We dreamt, we could visualize that we will need a place like this. So that's how it started. And in 2001, um, we have set up this hospice. I must give credit to our former president, Lee Dono. She gave all her, her, all her time and she really devoted herself into developing this thing. After two successful years as the president of NMA, Mrs. Nidonyo Angami retired in 1997 to fully dedicate herself to the fight against HIV AIDS. Yet, she still finds the time to participate in peace-building activities. Keshele Chishi was elected the third president of NMA. As with each new generation, Keshele brought in new ideas to the original legacy of Naga Mothers Association. While remaining politically neutral, the young mothers are also expressing their opinion about the unresolved political problems. Uh, when we talk of politics, yes, uh, our elders' idea may differ and the younger generation's idea may differ. When we talk of politics, it doesn't mean, you know, one joining in uh, any of the political parties. You know, it's something to do with our future. If somebody is going to decide of our future, and if, we are, if it is not something right for us, I think we have every right to object to it. But when we say that we should involve ourselves, it should be in a very constructive way, not in a destructive way. At the annual conclave of the Lotta Women's Organization, she welcomes all women to NMA and appeals to their spirit in the name of motherhood to heal their society. 
আজি আহিগে না আপনার খান এটা ইমান জমা গেল না থাকে তো দেখি কেন আমি বেশি মন ডর হওয়া আছে নাগামা ড্রেস কইলে নাগামা ড্রেস খালি অফিস ড্রেস খানি নয় তো আমি খান সব আছে আর এটা নাগামা ড্রেস কই কেন ইমান আগে তে যাব পারা তো কোন নিমিতে আছে আপনার খান লাস্ট সাপোর্ট পা নিমতি আমি খান বি আগে যাব পারা আছে as usual the response is overwhelming i mean it's never set on a bed of roses we do have thorns around and so we do face a lot of problems if there is no challenge i think that's uh, uh, that's not a life because in life you need challenges uh, some challenges brings us you know encouragement and some challenges brings us discouragement but whatever it may be i think we need challenges and this through these challenges we are able to come forward and then you know if everybody seems to appreciate us i think that's not going to get, take us anywhere we also need criticism and we do come across a lot of criticism and we cannot please everybody for that matter be it faction or you know overground or underground for that matter the church is there the naga ho ho is there but these are all male dominated um traditional organizations you know you expect them to be there the fact that women are there and women are there as equal in equal status shows you the huge leap that has been made in the year 2000 nidonyo angami was honored by the padma shri award for peace by the president of india in 2005 she was nominated for the women nobel peace prize It was a victory for all Naga women. I think if anyone deserve a Padma Shri in Nagaland, I think she really deserve it. <laughs> Scrolled across numerous walls are little poems, the talk of joy and happiness, the talk of our loved ones. whom we shall meet once again on the other side of the rainbow i cannot say if we nagas have become emotionally numb during all these years of living in constant terror but i do know that we have learned to smile through our tears the peace process continues amidst fierce violence and suspicion youngsters move about in relative security new ideas and a sense of entrepreneurship fill the air we have rebuilt our homes and our lives and we shall build a bold new future secure in the love and blessings of our mothers I have no pers- no personal answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>